My name is Tom Zeiler. I am the pr uh, professor of history and the director of the program in international affairs here at CU Boulder. Um, this panel directly addresses my research and teaching interests and I want to make sure all questions are uh, above board and clean because I got 19 of my students sitting over here to my left. <laughs> Very impressionable youth who will also um, be asking questions. Um, this panel actually grows out of a, uh, an, an international affairs seminar that we're holding now uh, this semester. So I thank the Conference on World Affairs uh, for having that too. Um, and again, these students are here now ready and eager to hear the thoughts of our panelists. Before introducing the panel, um, please note that I will accept um, questions from the audience um, through the CWA app, which I have now, and I'm, um, when you have questions, you can send those to me. Here's, here's how you do it. Um, we'll utilize both the Conference on World Affairs app and a note card system from, for, to receive questions from you. To ask a question in the app, simply select the session in the schedule, okay? Se select that session and tap live Q&A. Now you'll see a section there that says live Q&A and then insert your question. You may also raise your hand at any time to request a note card and pencil from one of our producers who will be circulating. Um, we'll, we, not, we won't be using a microphone here except for us up here. So note card or the app. Is everybody clear on that? And if you have any questions, you can talk to a producer. But again, for the app, uh, schedule, uh, tap on the schedule, live Q&A, and then insert your question. We are not necessarily going to uh, talk in the order uh, we're sitting here. We had uh, a, a bit of um, uh, moving around. But I'd like to uh, introduce all four of our panelists, turn it over to each one of them to speak for no longer than 10 minutes. And I told them I would give the, the death whatever, whatever we do in Syria or whatever. And then um, we will open it up immediately to question and answer, okay? We will not have them respond to each other. Uh, I'm sure in, in perhaps in the Q&A they will respond to each other, but we want to turn this over to you in the audience. To my immediate left, your right, Joe Cerincioni is the president of Plowshares, a foundation focused on eliminating nuclear weapons. He brings with him vast experience on nuclear issues from works in Congress, Carnegie Endowment, the Peace, the Center for American Progress, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a prolific author on the issues of nuclear weapons. And then there was the Stephen Colbert Show in 2009, in which you ought to look at that. He gamely and seriously played on a show called Sanction, Bomb, or Marry, <laughs> in which Stephen Colbert put in Iran, Pakistan and North Korea, and he could, always, he could only say, could sanction, you're going to sanction one of those, but once you sanction, you now had to marry or bomb the rest. Uh, he, more than, he more than held his own logically with Colbert, no small feat, especially after listening to Colbert, Colbert's sound. About So including Colbert's sound performance of, nuclear, of a nuclear explosion and, res and, and of course, resisting bombing. Um, to his left is Heather Hurlbert, who directs the New Models of Policy Change Project of New America, a progressive advocacy group that provides strategic direction in foreign policy and politics. And she's particularly interested in the communication of elites with American citizens when it comes to foreign affairs. She's co-authored a book and on that and ran the National Security Network that focused on this kind of messaging. Her government service includes stints in the Clinton administration and in Congress as well as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Heather also hosts a podcast, very vigorous and lively. It's a vital presence on Twitter where she's engaged Americans in our current foreign policies including on Russia, Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and of course Syria. To her left is Bob, Robert Kaufman, Bob Kaufman, who from Pepperdine University, a professor of public policy, the author of several books on U.S. foreign policy and security, including one on, assist, uh, on an assistance to President Richard Nixon on the president's last book. He has lectured and taught around the country in his latest book called Dangerous Doctrine, critiqued Obama, or President Obama's grand strategy and made a sensation 
and has been pro proven very timely as it advocates for a more muscular response to the world. He is a repeat offender, having attended the Conference on World Affairs now nine times. And he'll Ten. be here on campus. <laughs> Thank you. And will be here on campus next fall as, as the university's fifth visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy. We'll actually be teaching in the International Affairs Program. Too. <laughs> and finally, to his left, Janet Breslin Smith is the president of Crosswinds International Consulting, which focuses on higher education and outreach for women. Over her three decades long career, she has served as a professor of national security strategy at the National War College and on the staff in the U.S. Senate, including as legislative director for Senator Patrick Leahy. With her husband, Ambassador James B. Smith, she has lived in Saudi Arabia, where she particularly championed women's issues, especially networks for young Saudi female lawyers. Welcome to all four of our panelists. Thank you. And let's get going. As I said, each panelist will speak for no longer than 10 minutes and will take questions. First off, I would like the panelists to address the topic of the panel. Would we be better off in our foreign policy by not playing? Mm -hmm. In other words, I think this relates to a periodic debate, and we're in that period now of whether the United States should do more or do less in the world. And this in terms of President Trump's agenda and the dangers of being drawn into a war or of losing out economically in trade and aid relationships. Shouldn't we think twice and look inward or should we look more outward? Let me pass it to our panelists. Heather? Thanks, and I really want to thank CWA for hosting a panel on this topic and inviting me to be on it. Um, as I said in the previews, I've been trying to write an article on the, the topic I'm about to go into for about six months now, and it just kind of, um, this is reassuring, I hope, to all the students in the room, it just kind of sits sadly in my computer as 400 <laughs> words that I kind of never get all the way on finishing and submitting. So um, thank you for giving me this chance and yet another kick to actually pull up the draft and get something done with it. Um, this has been a very, a, both a hotly discussed topic in the last year or a few years and also a really challenging topic to follow. What do we mean when we call someone an isolationist or a retrencher? What do, what do we mean by engagement? Um, how do we understand how to sort politicians, leaders into categories, and what are the categories? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that piece of this debate, and um, I think my, the folks that follow me are, are gonna take clear positions, and in the Q&A it'll be pretty clear what my positions are too. But um, we are used to thinking about American politics along an axis that goes from hawk to dove. Um, and frankly, that, that has its uses, but its uses are pretty limited. It only really takes you so far. Uh, some of us in the room may have read, it's I think 20 or more years old now, uh, Walter Russell Mead put together a four quadrant ax um, axis, which basically has hawk versus dove along one line and more engagement in the world, less engagement in the world on the other axis, and then just to make it fun and more like horoscopes, he gives each quadrant the name of a president. Um, and that's also a useful axis, but it only takes you so far, as we saw during the presidential campaign, where if I had five bucks for every time a reporter called me up and asked me, wasn't Donald Trump the real peace candidate, um, I would have bought you all a drink today. <laughs> um, but um, so, so this, this is a topic that we love to talk about, and frankly, we don't really understand what we're talking about. And I want to suggest um, that there's three axes that you want to to place yourself and other leaders and public figures that you're thinking about on. Um, and the first axis is you know, kind of the classic one, what is the appropriate role of force in American foreign policy? And there you can kind of go from a pure pacifist, force is never appropriate, of, of whom there are really very few to none, but it's a useful straw man to have at one end of your axis, to the other end of your axis, which is force is pretty much always the best thing to do. Why mess around with anything else? And again, you, you, I'm hard pressed to name anybody who really fits at that pure end of the spectrum, but it's pretty easy to line up um, other prominent Americans along that axis. The second axis, um, which similarly is, is not that hard to grasp intuitively, is how engaged should the U.S. be in the world? And at one end of that axis, you have people who say, you know, frankly, the kind of rhetoric that as a speechwriter 
in the Clinton administration, the Clinton campaign, and numerous, uh, that I've been writing this rhetoric for 20, embarrassingly long now, you know, and you can all recite along with me, the world is interconnected, the world is globalized, when the butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, you feel it here in Boulder, no problems can be solved, come on, you can start reciting with me anytime you want, <laughs> no problems can be solved without everyone coming together, and you know, I think um, this axis, it's, it's really important for those of us who, who, I mean, have been saying and writing all those things because we believed them very strongly, to recognize that there's a strong proportion of our fellow citizens who either don't believe that, simply don't believe that that's true, they don't see it in their daily lives, the examples and the rhetoric we've used to talk about it aren't meaningful to them, or, frankly, they see it and they don't like it. And they would like to go back to, or go to, a place where we didn't have to think quite so complexly. And, you know, there's a, there's a divide in philosophy between cosmopolitans and, and communitarians, and both, we tend to demonize whichever pole of this, this axis we're not on, but both are incredibly valuable. And the folks who say, no, actually, what happens in Syria doesn't matter for us, what happens for us matters for us is also a voice that we, you know, on the other end, have not done so well in, in taking account of, and you don't, you can believe those things very strongly without being a bigot, a neo-Nazi, a, a Lindberghian, of course, there are people who are all of those things. So that's axis number two. Axis number three, which I think we have struggled to recognize at all, is where does, where does, where do you believe that legitimacy and authority come from in international relations. And here I would suggest there's a spectrum that has Ted Cruz at one end and 350.org at the other. And what do I mean by that? Um, Ted Cruz, who gets a rap for not believing much of anything, but does have several, I think, clear and consistent beliefs, one of which is, if it ain't in the Constitution, if it can't be discerned from a pretty originalist interpretation of the Constitution, you have no business doing it. So you have no business, for example, entering into treaties that limit the rights of U.S. states in a way that the Constitution suggested to its framers that you couldn't limit the rights of states. Um, you have no business um, undertaking any kind of obligation overseas that, that limits, you know, for example, we have the Second Amendment, and if you have a particular interpretation of the Second Amendment, you have no business signing an international convention that limits the small arms trade because that violates the Constitution, according to this interpretation. Now, at the other end of this spectrum, you have people who say, well, the global commons, the global good, um, you know, nobody, nobody except conservatives who want to criticize it really uses the phrase global government anymore, but international authority, international law, that's the, 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 the relevant standard, you know, going back to this idea that we're a global, we're we're living globalized and interconnected, and therefore we need rules that connect all of us, and so those standards not only should override U.S. law, but should um, generate how we do things and how we think about things. And so, for example, you you should be doing something like the International Climate convention, and you should be using that as a way to organize both national law, but also local and state level law. Um, and when you put those three dimensions together, it kind of helps you tease out, you know, the differences among, say, a Bernie Sanders and a Hillary Clinton, or a Bernie Sanders and a Donald Trump, where, you know, as I said, I noticed a lot of confusion during the primary that both Trump and Sanders seem to score relatively low on the let's use the military to go change society scale, but obviously scored very differently on the where does legitimacy come from, who has legitimacy to act in international affairs. So I, my you know, first overall point would be as you think about how to organize, how, how to place yourself, you know, imagine, this, imagine this 3D grid. The second point I would make that just really perverts this debate and to me makes it almost meaningless is how much of the conversation the American media but also frankly our decision makers um, conflate doing stuff with spending money on the military. Um, and the idea that you know we do too much and by do too much I mean Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Um, as you know, you you there are again there are people who legitimately believe we do too much, and that means USAID shouldn't exist. You know, and I think you know Trump has been explicit about this, and it's an explicit point of view. It'll be interesting to see once he discovers what those tools are good for, whether he wants to give them up or not. But there is a legitimate, consistent point of view that says. The U.S. has no business helping develop other, other societies. The U.S. has, the US has no business promoting the um, trade and products of our corporations. They can do that by themselves. The U.S. has no business um, you know, trying to promote a positive story about the U.S. government and U.S. society. The market can do that by itself. Um, the U.S. has no business trying to negotiate international agreements on subjects like climate change. You know, we should, should, but most of the time, when you talk about the U.S. and the world, what it turns out you're talking about, and unsurprisingly, because of the grotesque disparity in how much we spend, you're actually talking about what we do with the military. Um, so you then, you, you find yourself in the sort of odd position of saying, well, I want the U.S. to do a lot more in the world, but I don't want to do it with the military, and so actually that would end up costing less money. And so you've, you've just, by that statement, you've just kind of hit three different axes at once and made it very hard for, for your audience to follow what you're saying and to sort of legitimately pin you down and say, well, what is it you want to do in the world and what is it you don't want to do in the world? So, you know, there's a, so we're now going to enter into a more substantive debate where I think people are going to sketch out different visions of what the U.S. should and shouldn't do in the world, but the debate is so um, sort of misshapen by the idea, you know, the average um, combatant commander in the U.S. military has more resources, has more diplomatic resources and more diplomatic ability than an ambassador or an assistant secretary of state does, has an easier time getting a plane to fly around sometimes than the secretary of state does. Um, and that you know, creates a situation where you are spending an enormous amount of money and you are projecting an image of America that leads with our military. And our military is an amazing force, you know, unlike anything that's ever been assembled in human history, but it might not always be the first impression you want people to have at us. Um, it might not even be the second impression you want. And of course, then you have the problem that Hollywood is the first impression people have of us, and that's a whole other problem that others can discuss in another panel. So. Again, when you're talking about should the U.S. do more or should the U.S. do less, it's really a meaningless conversation unless you get quite specific about what are the kinds of things that you want American that you want the U.S. to do, and what's your theory about how the things the U.S. does or doesn't do affect Americans back home. And I think the last point I'll make um, is a little bit of self-criticism that um, we. The U.S. played a central role in building a set of institutions, a set of global institutions after World War II. And many of us who are very disconcerted by um, President Trump's sort of cavalier to hostile approach to those institutions, our first instinct is to just defend, defend, defend them. But there's a legitimate, you know, it's been 50, 60 years, 70 years, and some of these institutions were created, and it is perfectly legitimate for Americans to ask, what have they done for me lately? What are they doing not to defend against the challenges that existed when they were created, but to exist against new challenges? And if you can't tell me what they're doing against new challenges, why the hell do they exist? So that is the challenge that people who, who like me, are sort of emotionally located on the let's engage side, size of the spectrum, now is we have to start, we have to start this argument all over again from the get-go, and I'll uh, turn it over to Joe, who I think is gonna do just that. Thank you, Heather. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are in foreign policy freefall. It's not a question of whether we should play the game. We're trying to figure out what game it is with this administration. I honestly think there would be more protests against the national security policy of this administration if the protesters could figure out what the policy was <laughs> that they should be protesting. We have officials making contradictory statements about our policy on the same day. This has produced tremendous anxiety among our allies who cannot figure out what we stand for anymore, are fearful of what it might mean. 
I would say the mood in Washington is somewhere between grave concern and outright panic at this point over the administration. And I don't think this is a liberal conservative divide on this. There are, there are many people on both sides. One of the, the writers I like to read the most is David Brooks from the New York Times. I think he writes just brilliantly. And so here's a column he wrote yesterday. I'll just read the first paragraph. I just read that the Trump administration has filled only 22 of the 553 key positions that require Senate confirmation. 22 of 553. This makes me worry that the administration will not have enough manpower to produce the same volume and standard of incompetence that we've come to inspect so far. <laughs> Granted, in the first few months, the administration has produced an impressive amount of ineptitude, but very few people. <laughs> and he goes on from there. <laughs> and it gets worse. <laughs> it, gets, it gets worse. But th that's the feeling that, that Either the administration doesn't have a fixed point of view or it's unable to articulate that fixed point of view. So for example, just yesterday, this was yesterday, the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said, why should the American people care about Ukraine? Okay, our allies said, well, you should care about Ukraine because this is vital to, the, national, to the, uh, the security of the continent and we stand for the rule of uh, uh, the international laws against other countries invading neighboring countries and we have to stand firm on this lest Russia get the idea that they can do the same kind of thing with Ukraine as they did to Eastern Europe. To a person, the NATO allies responded in this way. He also pledged that the U.S. would not stand idly by and that we would protect innocence against savagery. This is a far more sweeping statement than anything any official in the Obama administration ever said. You remember Sim Sim Ambassador Samantha Power and others, the right to protect, arguing that we should militarily intervene in crises like those in Africa where innocents are being slaughtered. But that was resisted by the administration, by the, by, by the American public. And here's Rex Tillerson making that kind of statement. What does he mean by that? Do other people agree with this? You see Nikki Haley, the ambassador. You see Sean Spicer, the, the press secretary. Um, you see General Mattis making other statements more often as contradictory with each other. The one sort of lodestar, the one solid point in this administration is the Secretary of Defense, in my opinion. We are very lucky that James Mattis is our Secretary of Defense. He speaks with clarity. He speaks with, with competence. He speaks with a, a keen understanding. Partially that comes from his command of the Central Command and understanding, as Heather just referenced, the diplomatic problems you face as well as the military ones in trying to solve U.S. foreign policy. But we, I, we don't know what role he's playing and whether he has the deciding voice in this. Um, there, are, there are others, perhaps General McMaster, the head of the National Security Council, but the National Security Council itself is just is riven with, with, with feuds and fights not yet fully staffed. The Department of Defense is not fully staffed. There are 50 positions that the President can appoint. 50, five zero. He's appointed one so far. So in many ways, the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State are home alone. They do not have the team necessary to implement a coherent foreign policy if there was a coherent foreign policy. What do we stand for? Are we pulling out of the Middle East or getting deeper in? Are, is NATO good or bad? Uh, should we use military force? Should we talk to Kim Jong-un or are we going to attack Kim Jong-un? This administration has, had, has said firm, committed statements on both sides of those issues. So we just, we, we just don't know. And it wouldn't be so bad if this was occurring at a time of peace. But it's not. America is at war. We've been at war for over 14 years now. In fact, we, some of us spoke to the high school today, and I realized that the kids we were talking to had never known a time when America was not at war. And many of the college students, their living memory is America at war. 
And so we have lives at stake, we have alliances at stake, we have vital national security at, st at stake, and we have an unsteady hand uh, on the tiller. And right now, let me just give you an example. We have two crises simultaneously on opposite sides of the earth. You, maybe you saw we just dropped a very large bomb in Afghanistan, something called the MOAB, the massive ordnance air burst munition. Um, this is an, an, an impressive device. It has about 11 tons of explosive force. The bombs we usually drop are 1,000 pounds, a half a ton, sometimes a, a, a thousand, 2,000 pounds, a, two ton, a, a, a one ton bomb. So this is the equivalent of, do of dropping you know, somewhere between, between 10 and 20 normal bombs that we drop. So it's not a lot. It's a lot for one bomb, though. We dropped it on a, what we said was an ISIS tunneling structure in Afghanistan. What does that mean? Why are we doing that? We've done stuff similar to this, in, especially in the early days of the, both Afghanistan and Iraq war, but why are we doing it now? Why are we doing it now? What does it mean? Is this a signaling? Is he trying to s signal something for the Korean crisis? It, it, it's unclear. It, it's unclear. What we do know is that the tough talk on Syria is ratcheting up. So Rex Tillerson, among other things, said yesterday that, that, that it was Russia has to stop this. Russia has to stop Assad. We were previously had said just, last, just five days ago that what happens to Assad is up to the people of Syria. Now the Secretary of State is telling Russia that they've got to pull him back, that they've got to pull him. And he was met by this foreign minister of Russia, Lavrov, who wagged his finger at the Secretary of State and told him, don't do that again. Don't strike Syria again. Huh. Now, Hillary Clinton had her differences with Russia. There was some harsh talk, but the tension was never like this. There was never this level of disrespect shown. And remember, this is coming from Russia, a country that candidate Trump has said he wanted to improve relations with. What's wrong with the U.S. and Russia cooperating? The whole point of the, one of the main po po policy points of the Trump candidacy was that he was going to improve relations with Russia. We now have the worst relations with Russia than we've had since the Cold War ended. In fact, during the last few years of the Cold War, relations were better between Reagan and Gorbachev than they are now. And just to point out why this matters, and not, it's not just words, it's not just a stand, it's not just with my moral certitude here in the world, we now have 500 combat troops in Syria. This is in addition to the special operations forces. In fact, it may be more. We've stopped the practice of announcing troop increases. Huh. We no longer have transparency in where our military commitments are growing. So we have combat troops in Syria operating very close to where Russian troops are, very close to where Syrian troops are. What happens if we cross Sean Spicer's red line? He warned Assad not to drop another barrel bomb. You know how many barrel bombs Assad dropped last year? 20,000. He dropped 450 last month. You think he's not going to drop another barrel? Well, OK, let's see. This is an interesting experiment. Let's see if Assad is listening to the press secretary. Let's see what happens. And when he does do that, what do we do? Do we strike? And what do the Syrians do next? Do they mortar <coughs> our troops? And what do we do? Do they, we then fire back? Do we kill Russians? And then what happens? <coughs> Nobody seems to have thought this out, and that's what instills us with, with fear, with concern. Meanwhile, we have an armada steaming over to North Korea who will very likely test a nuclear weapon again on Saturday. It's all signs are pointing to that. Can we stop them? Maybe. But if they, if they do test, does the president think that the use of force, a chest-thumping display, is somehow going to work against North Korea? The problem is that North Korea can shoot back, and they could shoot back and launch a war unlike anything we've seen since the Korean War, a major conventional battle. Forget the nuclear weapons that they have. Even without the nuclear weapons, hundreds of thousands of South Koreans would die in the first few hours of a Korean War. These are the kind of stakes that we have. In my view, we have been playing the completely wrong game in the Obama years, in the Bush years, and now in the Trump years, emphasizing posturing, looking for some illusory military solution to these problems. We've been killing people in the Middle East for 14 years in very large numbers. 
Maybe a time, it's time we stopped playing that game. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bob? As usual with CWA, uh, I will register first an objection with the title, should we play. This is not playing, this is vital. Our freedom depends on it, the freedom of our democratic allies depends on it. So should the United States take a greater or lesser role in the world and what does that mean? I have a very clear position that I've enunciated in a number of books and that is to say, uh, following the great uh, Samuel Huntington of Harvard, uh, the world is most dangerous when it is perceived that the United States is disengaged and militarily weak. Samuel Huntington identified a positive correlation between American freedom, prosperity, security, and the spread of the democratic zone of peace and the robustness of American power, and a negative correlation when the United States retrenches. Uh, I will not uh, regale you with the arguments of my most recent book that argues that we have dangerously retrenched and built down our military capability, lowering the barriers of aggression in the most vital geopolitical regions. I will tell you that uh, then General James Mattis heard me present this book at the Hoover Institute at Stanford and congratulated me, said he agreed with everything I said, and my remedy, which is this. The United States must continue to have the capability, the will, and the resolve to play the world's default power, preventing any hegemon from dominating any of the three major regions in terms of power potential of the world. Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia. That means the prime goal of American foreign policy in Europe and East Asia is to maintain and extend the democratic zone of peace. The prime enemies to that are Putin in Russia and an increasingly authoritarian, belligerent expansionist China, a regime that constitutes our number one danger in the most important geopolitical region of the 21st century. In the Middle East, except for a decent and democratic Israel, we do not have the luxury, even though it would be more desirable, to rely solely on decent democratic allies. Except for Israel, we have to choose the lesser evil, which is a more pro-American authoritarian set of allies, such as General Sisi in Egypt. So we have to do more rather than less because it's penny wise and pound foolish. What I advocate is what Winston Churchill called a preponderance of power in favor of the forces of freedom. Uh, Sun Tzu, the great strategist, pointed out uh, more than 2,200 years ago that the greatest uh, generals are not those who win 100 battles but create situations of strength where they don't have to fight in the first place. A strong, robust, resolute United States in these major geopolitical regions is the best remedy to minimize vital threats and to defeat those threats when those threats can't be deterred at the lowest possible cost and risk. Uh, we've been through a period of dangerous retrenchment in my view and in the Obama administration, a dangerous confusion where we have misidentified our friends and our enemies. Uh, we pursued an ill-advised, though consistent, strategy of engaging the most illiberal American enemies, such as Putin's Russia, which the Obama administration enabled through its misguided reset and subordinated our relations with decent democratic allies such as India, Japan, Israel, Great Britain, to the vain hope that we could engage those regimes that hate us not just for what we do, but existentially for who we are. Where does Donald Trump fit on this spectrum since it's very clear I don't care for Obama's grand strategy? And the issue is uh, I have had deep misgivings about President Trump 
because there is a high degree of volatility and uncertainty to President Trump's trajectory, let's be honest. Uh, this is a man with very little foreign policy experience whose seminal work on the subject is the art of the deal. Uh, that's not reassuring. Uh, during the campaign, especially for Reaganite interventionists like me who believe in the robustness of American power, uh, he used the term frequently and still does, America first, which to me and people like me carries a very negative baggage of evoking the memory of Charles Lindbergh and isolationism perilously advising the United States to stay out of World War II, which is strategically and morally insane. I don't think, however, Donald Trump fits in any traditional category, and he is also a work in progress or regress. <laughs> the president that most uh, the president that Donald Trump most resembles temperamentally, although the world conditions are dramatically different, is Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a man who believed in asserting America's interests vigorously and unilaterally when his sense of honor was violated. Um, now, you may say that Trump has no sense of honor. <laughs> I, I think that's wrong. I think you may not like Trump's sense of honor, as you may not have cared for Andrew Jackson, who uh, murdered several people in a duel and uh, did duel. But I, I do believe that Donald Trump does have a code where he will vigilantly assert American interest, wisely or unwisely, when he perceives that code of honor transgressed. And I think that's true in Syria. I am moderately uh, more optimistic about two-thirds of Trump's grand strategy than I was in January. Uh, I think he has moved away from being enamored with Putin and realizing that Putin is a threat to peace. I think he's moved away from his original cavalier disregard of the vital importance of democratic alliance systems and America's role in it. Just yesterday, encouragingly, uh, he vowed that NATO was an absolute interest of the United States that we must protect. And NATO, for all its problems, is still vital for the original purposes that Lord Ismay, the first commander, stated when NATO was formed in 1949. To keep the Russians out of Europe, to keep the United States in Europe, and to keep a decent democratic Germany anchored in the West rather than play the loose cannon of Europe. The United States is the only country with the power and resolve to balance Putin in Russia. Europe has not successfully balanced against illiberal threats since 1914. The United States is the only power that can be the default power maintaining a geopolitical equilibrium in the East Asia, with Japan, India, and South Korea the linchpin of a democratic alliance system. This is the area where I thought Trump would be better than Obama, I think he's not as bad as Obama, but his le recent summit with Z Xi Jinping raises, for me, profound questions about whether Trump understands the deeply expansionist, aggressive Chinese challenge to world order in the Pacific springing from the illiberal nature of the Chinese regime and the aspirations it has generated. I fear that in East Asia, the logic of the art of the deal may triumph over the geopolitical and moral imperative of the United States maintaining a robust deterrent, because I don't see China as becoming number one. I see China inevitably having the same type of existential crisis that the Soviet Union had, and I want the Chinese to face a robust America the way Gorbachev faced Reagan. 
finally, I think thanks to James Mattis and H.M. McMaster, we are moving toward a coherent, more strategically sound appreciation that Iran is the number one enemy in the Middle East, and we have to forge a coalition of the willing to stop Iran from crossing the nuclear threshold. So doing more is going to save more in the long run. It will save much blood, toil, tear, as in sweat, and I hope President Trump does it, although it is a work in progress or regress, depending upon how things go. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Janet? Well, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm at the last part of this uh, pa wonderful panel, and what I want to do is give you uh, uh, an unconventional approach to this. I think about this issue a lot, and what I'm going to try to do, because I know our time is limited, I want to try to give you, especially for you students, a bullet form way of expressing how I'm thinking through this issue on only particularly one question. All of, everybody else legitimately has talked about the normal way we talk about international relations, states, geostrategic questions, men on the chessboard, how do they move around? Today what I want to address just briefly, and we can talk about it, is one particular challenge, and actually it's the one that President Trump led with, which is Islamic extremism, or whatever you want to call the challenge of violence within the culture and the religion in the Middle East particularly, but obviously Afghanistan and Pakistan and, the, and across the Muslim world. I want to trace for you how I'm thinking about this question. So kind of put your minds with mine and let, let me share with you how I'm trying to reason this through. Most of our concepts about this are state on state. And certainly when we think about war traditionally, it's state on state. Tanks facing tanks, air forces facing air forces, over land, over power. When the Cold War started, we expanded and changed this concept a bit because our opponent then was the Soviet Union. And so we faced two aspects. One, an expansionist state, the Soviet Union, had desires to take over Central Europe. If you remember, those of you who have <laughs> hair like mine, you, this is our lifetime, right? The Cold War. So it was an expansionist state, and it was an expansionist ideology, Marxism, which had a certain appeal, especially for colonial, uh, post-colonial era poverty in stricken nations. Marxism, socialism had a certain appeal. We designed then, or we were faced with the challenge, what to do. And in that case, we started with strategy. So George Kennan, among others, who were experts in the study of the Soviet Union and also others who were expert economists in studying Marxism, came up with the idea based on their deep and profound understanding. Kennan had been in Russia all his life for, for studying it. He knew Stalin. He knew what he was talking about in terms of understanding the weaknesses within that system. And Kennan predicted that the rigidity of the Soviet system its history, its psychology, combined with the rigidity of state control, Marxism, would eventually force that country to implode on itself. He said it would take patience. It did. It took my, almost my lifetime here until the Cold War ended. But his structure that we put around it for containment, which is what we called it, was alliances, foreign aid, a whole structure of things starting with that strategy. Now, I was teaching on the day of 9-1-1 at the War College. Ma General Mattis was a student of mine. So he, he's getting a lot of different views here. Um, I realized we were entering a new strategic era. And I watched, how are we going to come to grips with this new strategic era? Because, let me just, to my mind, it was distinct. The hijackers were from many different countries. Fifteen were from Saudi Arabia. but. The nation of Saudi Arabia had not declared war on us, right? They had not, you know, sent their armada against ours. These were people from that country. Some were from Germany, some from other countries. And so what we were facing, and I remember the intelligence community coming to us at the time and talking about this, 
we were facing a movement. Many nations, but it wasn't an alliance of nations, it was a movement of people. So it was an expansionist movement of people, not states per se. And it was an expansionist ideology, not Marxism. It wasn't an economic issue here. We're talking about a deeply held belief in a religious ideology that had a certain reaction in this era of both a combination of a notion of defending Islam and spreading Islam. Now, as I watched what we did, I realized, especially since I was teaching in those years, we acted before strategy. So we acted in Afghanistan, we acted in Iraq, and I'm not gonna go into all the different aspects of this, and I would argue we're still searching for strategy. It is difficult, and I keep thinking about this issue. Why is this so hard? Obviously, it's not state on state. Everything that our panelists have said makes sense. In a, in a geostrategic, I, I, you know, what do you do about China? What do you do about Russia? My students at the War College, they can put their brains to this. But what we're facing when we talk about Islamic extremism is, and this is my argument about this, can we change the premise and will that help us find strategy? And what I'm getting at is, as I look at our, my own experience in living in the Middle East, staying in contact with many friends from Egypt, from Jordan, obviously Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, what I feel is, is that we happen to be alive at a moment in history where we're watching profound pressures come in, constrict a extremely uh, strict, rigid, deeply held culture and religious belief. So I see this as a struggle going on right now within Islam and within the culture Obviously, each nation is distinct. Egypt is distinct from Saudi Arabia, et cetera. But when I talk to my friends and try to listen to them, their agony over Syria, and every night we lived in Riyadh, I saw pictures of Syrian children being killed. What President Trump just saw is on the TV every night. There are similar pictures in Yemen. There are similar pictures of poverty and destruction and agony all across the region. So what I'm trying to think through in my own mind is this is not like the past. So when I hear people say, and I hear it here in all my friends, oh, we don't need military force, we need to give more foreign aid. Well, Saudi Arabia is a wealthy nation. It's not poor. People are attracted to take up arms. Not, they don't need no, new roads. In a Marxist era, yes, we talked about foreign aid. But in this era, my argument is this is distinct. How can we deepen our understanding? Clausewitz, the great military theorist and strategist said, you need to understand the nature of the war and don't make of it something it is not. And so my argument is how can we deeply understand what's going on right now? Doctors, lawyers, people who have a pro-Western orientation are being killed in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, by their countrymen. This is a struggle, a profound struggle within each nation. And so what I want to leave you with is, and I have challenged some of my military students on this question, if you start from that premise, how can we conduct ourselves in a forceful way a respectful, forceful way to say, this is your region. This is your religion. These are your children. What do you want to do about this? This is on your plate. This is a, a billion people are adherents of this faith. We know what everyone says, that, that not, not all of them are, ter are terrorists, and not everybody, no, you know, of course not. But the intellectual capability is there. As Americans, I have to admit to this myself. I have it, I feel it's in our nature, somehow we want to fix problems. We either want to fix them, 
with military intimidation and force. I'm the problem, see. <laughs> Honestly, the beginning of every war is always optimistic. I remember when Bush started Iraq, it was shock and awe, and we were all optimistic. We want to fix things for other people. I wanted to fix my teenage children. I had great, I would like to fix my husband sometimes, but I would, <laughs> he's, he's not here this year. But I know, I know, and you know, true change comes from within a group talking to each other. The challenge to me, and I'll end with this, the challenge to me within my, that I hear from my friends, from <coughs> Saudi, from Egypt, from Jordan, Pakistan, is that are at that point right now, can they have the courage and the ability to talk to each other, probe each other, what do we want to do about corruption? What do we want to do about our children's attra attraction to violence? It is their religion, it is their region, they are their own children. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Well, let's, let's move to the question and answer again, the app or um, note cards. Um, and I've got a bunch of questions, um, uh, many of them directed at Robert, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's not pick on him. Let, Go let figure. Me, let me, let me uh, we're, we're not taking uh, questions from the audience directly. Get, make sure you get your hand up if you need a note card. Um, here's a question from a student, though, and it, and it uh, sort of stems from uh, Janet's remarks about the Middle East. Uh, that I'd like perhaps all three panels or four panelists to answer. If we have been fighting in the Middle East for 14 plus years with the same tactics, should we continue a failing and destabilizing strategy? Uh, well, one, I don't accept the premise to the question. We've actually tried a lot of things in the Middle East, and it's a very difficult place because of the nature of the intractable conflicts. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush decided to leave the Iraqi regime intact. Uh, that administration and then President Clinton tried to use the United Nations and sanctions. Uh, George W. Bush tried a different strategy. President Obama promised that uh, in a little known interview at, in New Hampshire Public Radio 2007 that uh, he understood the Islamic world and he would make things better, I'm quoting. Uh, according to the Pew Foundation, for better or worse, we are uh, more unpopular in the Islamic world uh, than we were before. So we have tried a lot of things in the Islamic world, but I don't think the Islamic problem, that's our most immediate problem. The greatest problem we face in terms of uh, geopolitical potential, China is the only potential competitor to the United States that can pose the can, I'm not saying it necessarily does, can pose the types of existential threat to American primacy that Germany did in the first 45 years of the 20th century and the Soviet Union did until 1990. Uh, Putin is in many ways playing a weak hand deftly. Uh, the Islamic Middle East is an immediate important problem, but secondary to the uh, the Pacific, which is, for all of my criticism of Obama, he got one thing right. Uh, East Asia is the most important region geopolitically and in every category for the 21st century. So I'll jump in on that and I'll say the way to answer that question is to say what is it that the U.S. is trying to do and reasonably can do in the Middle East and from that should then flow what do you what do you what should we be doing and what tools should we be using so um, I you know Robert you laid out some categories that are actually really really helpful is the US trying to retain or reassert its role as the default hegemon in the Middle East and if you believe that the US needs to be the world's default hegemon then yeah we're gonna have to be much more mi militarily engaged in the Middle East mm -hmm. than we are um, and that to my mind, at the same time as, as Robert says, you're also going to have to be engaged in Asia in a very intense way, should, should start to lead you to question whether, um, as possible as it was for the U.S. to be the world's default hegemon in the 50s, 60s, and, or 
um, sorry, not default hegemon because we were fighting the Soviets, but the hegemon of the free world in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it should lead you to question whether being the world's default hegemon is a, is a possible goal. But if that's your goal, then you've got to have boots on the ground in, in the Middle East. There, is, there, isn't, there isn't a cheap, there is no he hegemony on the cheap. Um, if you think that what happens in the Middle East has nothing to do with the US, um, and that we can safely let a, a generational conflict between indigenous forces in the Middle East play out, and that it was a mistake to get engaged in the first place and it has nothing to do with us, you know, then there's another answer to your question. I would also submit that that is catastrophically wrong um, and that actually no small part of our political problems and the political problems of our European allies, which is creating political problems for us, comes from the destabilization in Europe that flowed from the decision to let Syria go to hell um, unimpeded or largely or un not successfully impeded by us. So then you're sort of back in an ugly place if you say, well, no, we don't want to be, or we can't be, even if we secretly wish we could be, um, the regional hegemon or the, 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 the hegemon in the Middle East, but neither can we let it alone. Then your next question is, all right, what things do we want to do in the region that you can do some other way than with military force and what things, either because you believe you know, that force is the best tool or, as I, you believe that force is usually not the best tool but if you insist on leaving things long enough and letting them get messy enough, sometimes you wind up with no other choices. Um, you know, I see World War II as a great example of that, that um, there was not a non-military response to Hitler after a very early stage. Um, I would argue that there is not a completely non-military response to ISIS. There are some wonderful people who would disagree with me. Um, however, we also know that actually there's a lot of, if you think conflict and instability are the problem because they threaten our allies, because they threaten our economic interests, because they threaten a sense of common norms and basic decency that make the world a safer place for us to live in, um, we know actually from academic research that I hope is being taught here that the ways that you prevent and end conflicts most successfully are at least as much non-military as military. So this is where I get back to this question of doing something, um, you know, looks really different. Um, so, you know, in my view, do we, do we have the possibility of going to doing nothing in the Middle East, no, and no one who says we do, you know, that's just, it's not something you should take seriously. But, and frankly, you know, the US government does just a little bit of just about everything. So it's not even so much that we've never, you know, I mean, like some of the things that Janet talked about are things that have been tried, um, but they maybe haven't been tried on a large scale or they've been tried at the same time as we've been signaling, well, you know, we're gonna say that we're interested in this, but we're also gonna, you know, sort of bomb your community centers, or we're gonna drone people who we think are terrorists, but you think are possible participants in a civilian government down the road, and that sends a confusing yeah. message. So, so there's not a sort of pat answer, do these three things and not those three things, but if you're clear about what you're trying to do, then, you have hard choices, but pretty clear choices about what to do more of and what to do less of. Okay, thank you. And let's, and let, um, I'm gonna group some questions here and I want our panelists also to be as brief as they can so we can get more yeah. in. There's a, so, uh, several people have asked something related to human rights. Do we take human rights into consideration, especially if you think <laughs> of Israel's treatment of Palestinians or Syria or China or North Korea or refugees. What role does uh, human rights now have in American foreign policy in various regions? I know that's a, that's a tiny question. No, this, uh, maybe this is for Janet, but uh, I think this administration has been quite clear that human rights is not a factor we were, factor we're, we're giving great weight to. It's, it's uh, everything they've done since they've come in. Where are we? Day 88 or so, uh, has been to, to diminish the role of human rights um, in the formation of U.S. national security and foreign policy. Actually, you know, I, I thought about this. Uh, taking President Trump's statements right in the beginning 
the first few days or even leading up to the inauguration, and, and Robert made reference to this, I thought maybe his strategic vision was, in terms of the Middle East, was to, in order to get stability, you should, we should, along with Russia, provide support to the authority figures within the region to establish authority, in other words, to stop this chaos. So I thought, because I know Russia is making many more inroads into Egypt, for example, right now, I thought he, his vision might have been to join with Putin in support of Sisi in, in Egypt, in support of the Saudi uh, royal family, with a notion that, as you said, human rights are not as important as the chaos that is existing there, and so we should join together to support these authoritarian structures. And I thought that's where he was going, frankly. And so that when he then had this emotional reaction to the, mm -hmm. the little uh, child, the children killed after the chemical weapons attack, I don't, I don't know, I would be curious to know how he thought this well, through because it is what an authoritarian uh, leader could do. Can, can I ask you, do you really think he thinks these things through? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, 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 I do not believe Trump has a foreign policy. He has a set of impulses. Uh, yeah. In President Trump's uh, disinclination to emphasize human rights, paradoxically, is one of the things he shared with the Obama administration. Now, if you don't believe me, go to the Washington Post editorial page in September of 2013, where the liberal Washington Post editorial page called Obama's view of democracy the most crimped of any post-war American president. Now, for better or worse, there is a theory of, in international relations that says that the internal characteristics of regimes or the perceptions of their leaders matter less than pure considerations of power. Uh, in many ways, Obama and Trump shared that inclination. I think that's wrong. I think the, the most successful American foreign policies have recognized from Truman through Reagan that we do best when we combine American ideals and self-interest. And as for human rights, uh, Natan Sharansky's right. You're always better off with a stable liberal democracy when you can get one. Uh, let me add, however, the Rolling Stones have to be taken to, into account. You can't always get what you want. Uh, in the Middle East, for example, let's take Egypt and getting rid of Mubarak. Mubarak was an autocrat. He was corrupt. The default reaction was the revolution must be good. But it turns out that the Muslim Brotherhood was committed to one election, one time, to create an even more repressive regime. And then we have to go back in those circumstances to the great UN Secretary General of Ronald Reagan, great academic as well, Dr. Jean Kirkpatrick, who gives you guidance. What do you do when the choice is? Uh, Ugly versus uglier uh, for my wife, Mike Frank versus her husband. You have to choose the lesser geopolitical and moral evil based on ideals and self-interest. So human rights does matter. It should matter. And I think it's dangerous on the right and the left when human rights aren't considered a major consideration. There are times, however, oh, well, let me give you the classic example. Hitler invades the Soviet Union in 1941. Winston Churchill hates communism. He's right. He calls it evil, insect bacillus. And he goes on to the House of Commons floor and says nice things about the Soviet Union. People are astounded. And a reporter said the Marvin Gaye question, what's going on? <laughs> and Churchill responded, sir, in the predicament I'm in, if Adolf Hitler had invaded hell today, I'd have to make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. It doesn't mean that Churchill didn't know that Stalin was a devil. It doesn't mean that we don't or shouldn't prefer a decent outcome when at all possible. And we're always right to ask the question when we have to deal with a dictator, is there a better way? But sometimes you have to choose the lesser evil to avert the greater one. But I have to add something about this. This is a traditional response, and honestly, in the past, it worked. Um, when Assad's father was alive, in an era when a, a nation had one radio station, one TV station, 
one newspaper, and it was all controlled by the government, it was fairly easy and effective to be a dictator. You could control things. This has made it harder to do. And so sure, again, I did think this is the way Trump was gonna go, but the problem is, is that the kids, the, the, the analogy about Tahrir Square, the revolution started with this, kids coming without a charismatic leader to this big square to say this man is old, corrupt, and there's no future, and we feel hopeless. Even if we had said we support Mubarak forever, That's right. just think through in your own minds how that plays out with this. Just think about this. At the War College, when we teach strategy, part of the basic doctrine we challenge our students with in strategy is you have to balance your resources and your goals. During the Reagan administration, there was a famous man who wrote a wonderful book called How All Wars Must End, Freddie Clay, and he said, treason, yes, could be defined as going against your country, but it also can be defined as so over committing your country to wars here, 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 that you bankrupt yourself. So it's, a, I'm not advocating one or the other, but I'm saying everything we're talking about here has a cost, a human cost and a financial cost. And you put your chips on the table, and because this is harder to do, supporting authoritarian governments is harder to sustain their power. I think that's a, the strategic challenge right now. Your resources, I agree with the China stuff. I agree with great power challenges. You have to evaluate cost and benefit. But Janet, you're right that you couldn't say Mubarak and you couldn't say the Shah of Iran. But what do you do with General Sisi? Do you impose sanctions on him when Sisi is the authoritarian alternative to the Muslim Brotherhood? I, I agree with you Here's that, my prediction. That, that you can't President, say that. President Trump is going to see something happening in Egypt. These are both strong men. They have arrested tons of people that you would consider to be good business people, good civic leaders have been arrested in Egypt. Something will happen. Maybe Ivanka will see the picture <laughs> and say, oh, <laughs> you know, as a human being, we respond to children being hurt and, and people being victimized. But what, what should we do if the Muslim Brotherhood is the alternative in We're Egypt? We're going to try to get one more question okay. in. We can talk after. Thank you. <laughs> Let's, let me get one more question and try to bring it back to the uh, topic of this um, panel uh, about playing, and, uh, and specifically about President Trump. Uh, we have several questions on this, too. Um, uh, President Trump's campaign statements were rarely defined. He rarely defined his foreign policy, his vague statements. Um, can that explain some of his foreign policy today? Um, and specifically talk to what many perceive as his volatility. Um, some would say incoherence. Others would say perhaps this is a brilliant tactic of, of uh, the madman strategy uh, that Richard Nixon had in, uh, um, at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, which is it? What are we going to see from this president? What we've seen already? How do you assess him? Well, just for fun, I'm going to disagree with Joe a bit on this. Um, and Trump may have more instincts than um, academic theories, but um, he has some instincts on global issues that are really consistent over 40 or 50 years. He was taking out full page ads in the New York Times in the 80s, criticizing the Reagan administration for being too soft on the Saudis and the Japanese. Um, he was bragging to uh, New York Society reporters also in the 80s that he was positioning himself to become a key nuclear negotiator for the Reagan administration and his big plan was to team up with the Soviet Union to punish France for helping Pakistan proliferate. Um, so you can, you can trace a set and um, a consistent also pattern in his conviction that the U.S. is always on the wrong end of the deal, that deals are zero sum, um, and that, that sort of the U.S. is always somehow getting ripped off by foreigners. And so actually those sort of three 
instincts, if you will, lead you to a pretty consistent worldview that, um, that is, is unilateralist, um, that is aggressive, and that is particularly hostile to um, particular regions and races. And I think that approach has been consistent if, if toned down by his advisors and mm. colleagues. But I do think, I mean, that's who uh, the man is. And look, people don't change look, when they become president. Yeah. Okay, let's get everybody in. Real, real quick, uh, I, I, I admire your effort to, to impose some kind of rationality <laughs> uh, on what you're seeing. I really do. And that is what we try to do. And, and we more or less think that this is the way the world is working. And it's always been working that way, and it's going to work this way. And for some, their appetite for the use of force is insatiable. They want more. For others, you know, we, we want to emphasize the diplomatic tools more. But this, folks, this is something completely different. This, this is something that is beyond our experience, and I, I am deeply, deeply concerned about, about this presidency and this set of policies. We're playing with loaded guns now. This is a man who impulsively tweets, and now he's impulsively firing cruise missiles, and we've got to stop this guy before he impulsively fires nuclear missiles. And it's up to us. The Democratic Party is not going to do it. The Republican Party is not going to rein it in. Our academic conferences aren't going to do it. But there is a growing mass movement in this country that is trying to impose some restraints on what is going on in Washington. And I would encourage all of you to get as involved as you can with your money, with your time, with your ideas in the movement that is trying to make America safe again. Thank you. Yep. You want to go? I have a question. Um, um, Bob, you want to <laughs> respond? Uh, Joe and I disagree about whether the world is safer with America, uh, stronger or weaker, um, or less uh, militarily prepared, and, and I'm on the peace through strength side. Uh, I, I also think that I can't dismiss and I don't think a legitimate person can dismiss the, uh, the volatility. But, but I do think Heather is correct that some of what we've seen in Trump, and I helped Richard Nixon write his last book, and if you read The Art of the Deal, uh, this, this cultivated madness strategy, uh, which may be dangerous, uh, I think Heather's right that there's much more coherence to Trump's basic instincts that there is always a deal, even if there's bluster before it. I actually worry about that. But I, I do think Heather's right that there's more coherence to Trump's instincts internationally than we're giving him credit or blame for. So, so I'll but, leave it at that. But again, the only thing. Go ahead, Dan. You have the last word. Okay. The only thing I'm I, I'm concerned about this is my last pitch. For those of you who are interested in all these issues, read deep, if, especially about the Middle East. Read deeply about it. I mean, honestly, we're all good at making generalizations and at the abstract level, 35,000 feet level of politics. The culture there, when we lived in Saudi Arabia, it was the most confounding thing I had ever experienced. The culture is so distinct and different. And I realized we make assumptions. Being powerful will have this impact. Well, because we're looking at it through our eyes. If he intimidates me, I'm going to be scared of him. <laughs> if Good. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone, everyone is not American. And everyone is raised in their own distinct way and see things. And we need to deepen. If we say what we're facing in the Middle East has something to do with Islam, then we better study it. We better study the culture and understand it. I have one last ending comment. I made a reference to my husband. He is watching this streaming in New Hampshire right now and told me he does not need to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs>